Hi, everyone. I'm Nicholas. I'm founder of LabDAO, and we're going to be hosting the Decentralized Science and Big Data workshop. I'm really excited for it. OK, so I think there have been multiple attempts at defining decentralized science. Um, but I think we can, we can derive what, what is happening and where this word is coming from by just thinking about like, the process of science from first principles. So first, uh, science is a knowledge creation process. We don't know something, we have a question, we run an experiment, we learn something new. And then uh, new technology around knowledge sharing leads to new forms of knowledge creation. And I think a, a pretty good example for that in history, uh, two examples actually, is um, the invention of the printing press, which enabled the, the production of scientific papers at like a larger scale than what we usually saw. Before that, you had monasteries where like these codexes were hand copied, and suddenly there was an explosion in like proliferation of scientific communications all, among other forms of communications. And then um, actually from that time, like uh, around the creation of the Royal Society in like 1800s, that's where the concept of citations and papers sort of comes from when people start saying, okay, we don't need to respect these uh, old like antique uh, codexes anymore. We, 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 let's, let's break the scientific process down to like atomic units and start exchanging these papers and cite them. Um, and then we have the open science movement, which was, I think, very much timed with the invention of the web, uh, where uh, at CERN, um, there's this quote from Tim Berners-Lee where he says, well, the, the situation was just so dire. Every department, they had their own data. It was really hard to communicate. Um, so I just had to do the thing and, and uh, combined hypertext and other formats to like build, build what we now know as the web. So the web enabled the open science movement, and now with Web3, basically distributed storage and token-based ownership concepts, uh, we can open a new branch of the open science movement, which we call the decentralized science movement, which comes with some additional features. So some of the new paradigms that we have is that with content addressing, everything is citable now. Like there is no, there's no such thing as is this something that I can cite in a scientific publication because it has a digital object identifier or not? Everything can be cited now if it's content addressable because it's, there's a certain guarantee that it's static if it's pinned consistently. And then we have uh, another concept that I'm particularly excited about and, and we're going to be t diving into a bit today um, with the Bacalao team, which is content addressable transformations. So the idea that if your content is out there in the web, and it's directly addressable, you can think about the process of doing science, especially scientific computation, as a direct acyclic graph, where you can just, where if I have a starting point X, and I have a defined transformation, some piece of code that runs in a standardized environment, I can deterministically generate an output Y. So reproducibility is no longer opt-in. Reproducibility is opt-out. You need to actively not use these almost free tools um, at cost tools to, to be uh, you know not participating in like a highly reproducible infrastructure for scientific um, content generation and then the third concept technical primitives are tokens where tokens enable us to go from something that we know as co-authorship to something that is more looking like co-ownership um, where, where tokens enable us to take build collectives of authors they engage in a scientific project and then the citation, which was usually the metric to say, okay, who did most of the work, who did, like, who contributed uh, less so, um, is replaced with, okay, what is, the, what is the contributor token balance or the badge number that one scientist has in that particular project versus the next? So, so why does this matter? Why is this a desirable reform of the way that science works? Um, because with DSI, the, the hope is that we can give everybody the opportunity to raise funding for their scientific project, irrespective of their locations um, and irrespective of the exact nature of the project, whether it's to totally basic funding or very entrepreneurial, if you can post your project description online and you can give a multi-sig address, you know, chances are you have a higher likelihood of finding someone who really cares about your science than if you were staying into your national funding infrastructure systems. Then the second idea is that we can enable everyone to access laboratory services no matter where they are. We can create internet protocols that enable someone to book a laboratory service or some compute service and pay in tokens, irrespective of where they're based. So all you really need is, is, is a good idea and some knowledge about what needs to be done about it. And then third, 
is the idea that we can share materials in a new way, which both respects the inventor that generated that idea, but also makes sure that that, that new knowledge is accessible for a wider audience. So uh, at LabDAO, we started out thinking, OK, with this change in the communication infrastructure that's available, um, what, what defines an effective research environment? And could there be a completely online research organization? Because with token ownership, we can, we can think about like, these type of questions. And uh, we're, we're not the only ones to think about this. So this is a slide from Juan's talk a couple months ago. Um, ben Reinhardt wrote about private ARPAs, reinventing discovery. It's a really, really good read by Michael Nielsen. And, and Adam Marblestone and Sam Rodriguez have been thinking about nonprofit startups for science funding quite some time. Um, and there, there are multiple historic examples. So you probably know about Bell Labs. You probably know about DARPA. But I think one example that's a bit understudied is a Cold Spring Harbor. So who, who has ever heard of Cold Spring Harbor? All right, one. Yeah, that's, that's the marine biology project, of course, right? <laughs> so, so Cold Spring Harbor is 50 minutes outside of New York. Uh, it's a commuter rail. And uh, it, after World War II, Cold Spring Harbor, you, you, hosted these uh, interdiscipl highly interdisciplinary summer camps where they would teach scientists about phages. So bacteriophages are these viruses that target bacteria. And um, they're pretty harmless, at least to humans. And it, that's, that's very, not, very beautiful because it's a pretty good model to study like very fundamental biology. So at that time when they did these experiments, they didn't even know DNA was the, the currency of inheritance. So they brought together physicists, biologists, and, and they trained other scientists in, in, these, uh, in these phage classes. And in the, in the meantime, they also tinkered, and they came up with these extremely interdisciplinary science projects. Um, and I think something we can learn here is that you, you don't need a lot of time to actually come up with really new ideas, because they had just hung out here over the summer. They came together, they formed new ideas, and then they all went off into their respective environments and like executed on them until they could regather next summer. And what if the internet could be that place where scientists can come together, they hang out in a lobby, they form new ideas, and they can raise funding and execute on them using, using new tools. So an effective research environment is a place where you have access to scientific infrastructure. You need at least some lab space or some tooling. You need to be able to like, assemble your team extremely dynamically, depending on the need of the idea that you have. And then you need a, just a bit of funding to get started. And then once you see that you know, your idea has legs, you can then go and talk to the existing uh, funding agencies to, to get some real support. And the, really, the reason why we need uh, yet another science organization, I believe, is because uh, of this graphic here, which shows you that you basically have migration patterns of inventors on the, on the y-axis, where basically uh, above zero means there's a net influx of inventors, where an inventor is defined as someone who has authored a patent, and below zero means there's a net out uh, efflux of, of inventors. And there's really just one country that's a net importer of, of inventors at, at a big scale, that's the United States. And there are a lot of countries that are exporters of inventors. And um, they're, like I, I personally, for example, was born here, then I moved there, back, there, back, and eventually you ask yourself, why do we have to do this? We're in 2020, <laughs> it's like, why, why can't I just be online and I can like, work from anywhere? And I think there are a lot of other scientists that maybe didn't have the, the weren't lucky enough to be able to move that much, and, and they're sort of really locked out of the scientific enterprise altogether that's happening in the United States and other more wealthy countries. And if we can enable them to participate, I think that's something really worth fighting for. Uh, so that's how we arrived at Lapdow, and I think we're not alone. There are a lot of other projects in this space, and I'm, I'm really excited to see so many. Um, there are, uh, this, is a, this is a slide by Ultra Rare, uh, Jocelyn's team. Um, there are some DAOs that really think about, okay, we need to fund science, right? So scientists can apply to us with their idea. And then we have um, places where science gets done. I, I, you know, New Atlantis is one example here and, um, and, and other, other projects as well. And then we have other projects that think more about the infrastructure. Okay, how can we support scientific, uh, the scientific enterprise? So let's build a home for inventors that's completely online. 
some projects that we have been funding, and this is just to give you a taste of like what's currently happening, and uh, there are many others in this room, um, are, are four that just participate in the last Gitcoin ground that we, that we endorsed. Um, this one is with Gainforest, where we support them with uh, satellite image analytics uh, of rainforest integrity. And this is our iGEM team, where iGEM is an international student competition in synthetic biology. With the current advancement in uh, computational machine learning biology, we believe it's totally possible to have a student team compete that's only sitting on their laptops and, and basically generating hypotheses, and we just do one, two experiments and see whether what they came up with is actually real. Um, then we have Project Lion, which is a, a group based in California within LabDAO, together with TalentDAO, that's looking at large language models for measuring Discord community health. And then we have uh, the Knowledge Graph Lab, where uh, we actually are going to see one talk later from, from uh, Martin from Lateral about the work that's been happening there around discourse graphs. The needs that we've seen with projects that we supported and, and helped spawn is uh, we can bracket them into two buckets. There's uh, like a people dimension, and that's really big right now. Um, so teams need support to safely manage funds that they raise. They need this. Sometimes they have legal questions. They need questions with raising grants, knowing where they can go for their, with their idea. They need access to a community of scientists where new ideas can emerge. That's really how science works. It's extremely social. And uh, something that we're looking more and more into is contributor certificates. So if you raise a Gitcoin grant, do, do you want to give something back to the people that actually helped you? And, and how can we do that safely? And then on the other bucket, we have tools. So you don't only need talented people, and, and people that can advise you, but you also need some infrastructure. And right now, when you look at the basket of projects that we've been supporting, those are mostly happening on, like in the computational realm. So computational infrastructure is extremely important, but we're also looking into laboratory services. And this is just one example for an application that we've been onboarding to, to, to do some science, and especially benchmarking. Uh, this is Equibind. It's a graph neural network uh, that allows you to dock small molecules against proteins. It's basically the first step that ever ha always happens when you try to design a new drug. Um, and we wrap that, and uh, if you stick around for longer in this workshop, you're going to actually be able to use that um, because we're going to be running it on Bacalao, which is a, basically a Docker inference system uh, that's living on IPFS. Other applications that we're containerizing and making accessible to scientists are RNA-seq tools, histology image analysis tools, antibody language models, and so on. So mostly biased towards biology. Uh, we also onboard some wet lab processes, so antibody phage display when you want to develop a new protein-based medicine um, or just a generation expression of proteins overall. The way that we plan to make these tools available at scale is through a client that we're developing where Bacalao is a core dependency, uh, where scientists all over the world can down install the client, they have an account that they can fill top up with a balance of like credits where the credits are actually tokens, and that it can spend tokens to, to buy laboratory services, where most of the laboratory services will be computational in the beginning, but I think what something really worth working towards is to create an abstraction of physical laboratory services that feels just like running a compute job on a cluster. So I'm really excited that we're doing this together with the Bacalao team today. And uh, I'm, I'm going to actually stop here and maybe just give you a bit of an overview about what we're going to do right at the end of the workshop, which is uh, running some applications with Bacalao. So if you stick around, you have the opportunity to run Salmon, which is an RNA-C quantification tool. You can try to discover new drugs with Equibind, or you can help analyze some histology images for, for medical AI. All right, with that, thank you for coming.